Today's session will be a quick one all about time. We're going to deal with date time information and we're going to deal with precision time information. For date time information, I'm going to define two types. One will break time information out into the calendar and time of day denominations that we use for time normally. So that'll have year, month, day, hour, minute, second, maybe milliseconds or something like that. And then for the second time type in that category, I'll use something that smooshes all that information down into 64 bits. Neither of those are for precision. They're just two different sizes. One of them is larger, but more descriptive, easier to use to format date information to a user. The other is harder to use, but has the same amount of information squeezed down into 64 bits for compression of the data, basically. So with that plan, let's get into it. For starters, we have the two fundamental types for date time information, the dense time and the date time breakout. And in addition to those two types, we have the functions converting between them. The math for the encode and decode between date time and dense time is based on the idea of mixed radix numbering systems because that's what time is. It's a mixed radix numbering system. So what that means is on the encode, I'm multiplying in and adding in the components of the date time into a single number. And on the conversion back out from the dense time to the date time, I'm using modulo to extract the things that I added and then division to remove the things I multiplied in. If you want to understand that better, look up and study about mixed radix numbering systems. One part of this that's a little bit tricky is I wanted the year to be able to be signed so that I could if I needed to for some fun, weird reason, encode times before zero, you know. So because it can be signed, if I wasn't careful about it, it's possible to break this encode decode pair of functions because a signed number might go past the maximum value when it is interpreted as an unsigned value. Since signed values use their top bit as the positive slash negative indicator, it when it's interpreted as an unsigned value, it can just look like a very large integer, which means that if I just pick 32-bit signed integers, that would go past the limit of what I can actually smoosh into this 64-bit thing. So I spent a little time fiddling with it, and the simplest thing I found that worked was to use a signed 16-bit integer, which means that the actual limit on the years is I can't, this code won't keep working in the year 32, 7, 68. I think I can live with that. And I also wanted to make sure that whenever two dense times were compared, they would the one that was less than the other one would be corresponding to the time that was earlier than the other time. So to put that another way, if two dense times are not equal, then the one that is smaller should be the earlier time when we decode it into a date time. So for that, I just made sure that whatever the smallest negative value I could reach was, which is negative 32,768, I add that in when I encode it so that it starts at zero and goes up, and there's no issue with the dense times rolling over and becoming larger when the year goes negative. Next, let's go plug this stuff into the operating system layer.
Here's the API I'm going with. It's just three functions to do conversions back and forth between universal time coordinates and local time coordinates. And the third is for getting the current time from the system in universal time coordinates. For convenience, I have a couple of helpers that will make it a lot easier to build the main functions. And these helpers are just for converting between the operating system's version of broken out time and my own version of broken out time. There's also another helper that helps plug into the file system API that reports its time with the nth time type. But the API itself is fairly straightforward. It is a little bit complicated looking because there are so many parts to it. There's conversions in each direction for each thing that you might want to convert. But that's all there is to it. It's just conversions. So the operations themselves just end up looking like a series of conversions chained together which is not all that hard to write once you know what all the converters you need are. Finally, we just need to do some precision time stuff and we'll be done with adding time features. Precision time is all about times relative to other times so that we can use smaller quantities and not try to engage in the complexity of correlating that with real world time. So for instance, the sleep function doesn't take a time of day when it will wake up. It takes the amount of time until it wakes up and it happens to be in milliseconds because that's the one that's easy to do on Windows and Linux. And the other one, the now microseconds time function, which is for getting the current time as a timestamp in microsecond precision, doesn't actually have a way to correlate itself back to wall clock time in the real world. So you can get a microsecond timestamp, but you don't know what time of day it is from that. But the usefulness of this is you can also compare that micro time, microsecond timestamp to other microsecond timestamps to measure how much time has elapsed between different events with high precision. So that's the idea of, my, of uh, precision time. You do need to watch out when you're using this Windows API. Query performance counter doesn't return something to you in standard units like seconds or microseconds or anything like that. It returns a unit called counts, which is based on the operating system's own implementation of this function. So to find out how big a count is, you have to call query performance frequency, which tells you how many counts there are in a second. And so you can use that in a little dimensional analysis to divide out the right thing and multiply in the right thing to get whatever standard unit you want. And if you happen to be interested in how precise your time measurements really are, you can use that to find out too. And with that, we're done with the time handling features on the OS layer.